It's a beautiful ending to the Psalm 126 in that hymn setting with the refrain, the seeds that were watered once with tears shall spring up into a song. That juxtaposition of times of sorrow and suffering coupled with a vision of hope and fulfillment, it's there in the Isaiah passage, it's all through our Christian scriptures. And ultimately, it's behind the main themes of today's gospel lessons. This is a reading from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 1 to 8. It's a continuation of the conversation we had last week, the immediately preceding passage where the disciples and Jesus are in the temple of Jerusalem, admiring its grandeur, its precious metal coated stones and wealth, and notice that a poor woman placed two small coins in the treasury, and Jesus pointed her out. The very next passages, then, are here in Mark 13. Listen to the word of God. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings... And then Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another until all will be thrown down. When Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. These must take place, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines, but this is is just but the beginning of the birth pangs. Let us pray. Loving God, draw near to us once more as a people who have wept and a people who have rejoiced. May your words continue to illuminate us and inspire and guide us this day and always. We trust in you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I know this is a true statement. Whenever my family gets together, whenever Beth's family gets together, invariably the room is fairly loud with people sharing stories and telling anecdotes and passing forth with different memories. And I would assume that probably characterizes many of your own families as well. When we get together to tell stories, we will name both the highlights and the lowlights telling with glee the time when someone accidentally backed the car into the garage wall, celebrating when someone won the lottery, telling times of triumph and joy, whether on the sport field or in their business careers, naming adventures and trips taken, or retelling about broken bones and broken hearts. Now, some of the stories are so well known when we share them that we don't need to tell the whole story. We simply will say, do you remember when, and everyone hears the clue and nods and begins to smile at the, rep at the remembrance in their heart. Now, one of the most common themes and storytelling motifs at gatherings often involves giving birth or pregnancy. There was a literary magazine a couple years ago that asked five women novelists to describe their memories about being pregnant. One of them was a woman named Lydia Kiesling, and she described pregnancy in terms of a series of analogies. She said, sometimes being pregnant felt like having a rock in my shoe where the fetus was the rock and I was the shoe. But sometimes being pregnant felt like being with a new friend in a cozy little cottage where I was both inside the cottage and the cottage itself. Sometimes I felt enormously beautiful, like Venus rising out of the waters, 
And sometimes I simply felt enormous and old and feeble and short of breath. I remember at times feeling hungry. I mean, visit Burger King three times in one week hungry. I mean, buy one bagel with cream cheese and then go ahead and buy a second one and eat it standing up hungry. Pregnancy at times to me felt almost biblical. I felt like Eve and Mary, but really I felt more like Job or Jesus in Gethsemane, only sorrier for myself. I hated it a lot of the time, but it's so hard to think that I might never feel that way again. Now, Kiesling's analogies capture the mood swings of pregnancy, this juxtaposition of both times of discomfort and times of joy. If her story and her essay was set to music, it would alternate between the heart-tugging minor sixth and the soul-rejoicing major sixth. I felt enormous. I felt enormously beautiful. I hated it. I can't imagine not feeling that way again. Those contrasting emotions are so close to one another, like the tiny half-step difference between a minor and major sixth interval. And it's that close proximity to one another that fits this juxtaposition we associate with bringing a child into the world. The labor pains followed by holding a newborn. And it's a moment that we've put all into one English word, birth pangs. Now, birth pangs was the very last word in verse 8 of Mark chapter 13, and it captures that juxtaposition of the minor and major sixth, the convergence of opposites. Jesus and his disciples were sitting there on the hillside looking across the valley to the walled city of Jerusalem in all of its splendor, but also with its own prophecies of doom hanging over it. And in that moment, in Mark 13, Jesus offers the longest speech that he's going to give in that entire gospel. And he's going to tell them there will be times of trials and persecutions. There will be wars and rumors of wars. And so because of this language, some biblical scholars have named this chapter the Little Apocalypse. But I think they're wrong. Because in many ways, the chapter is just the opposite. It's Mark's little anti-apocalypse. Apocalyptic writings are present in the Bible in a few well-noted places. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, for example, the apocalypses talked about future days using cryptic references to periods of time like 62 weeks or 72 weeks. And then preachers have made a cottage industry out of decoding those cryptic references to tell us exactly when Jesus is going to return in power and glory. But if you read Mark 13 carefully, not only does it not contain any cryptic numbers or clues, in fact, Jesus, when he was asked by his disciples, when will all this be accomplished, refused to answer their question. He pushed them back. And he warned them, don't be led astray, especially by folks who think they know all the answers. At the other end of the Bible, the apocalyptic writing in the book of Revelation involves a speaker who has this vision, a vision of a world to come with prophecies about all the signs leading up to it. But Jesus in Mark 13 has no vision whatsoever. He's talking very straightforward to the disciples. And he tells them, point blank, don't try to read deeper meanings into the events unfolding around you. The temple of Jerusalem, yes, it will be destroyed. The Romans, yes, will continue to wage war in the land, even in this land. And there will still be natural disasters. But through it all, what Jesus emphasizes in this chapter is they should stay alert and they should hold on. Hold on to faith and hold on to God. This was not to be seen as a season of death, minor chords, 
but a season of life, of major sixth. Something new was being birthed. And that's why Jesus said this. It's just the beginning of the birth pangs. Now when things get rough, it is not easy to hold on to hope. But then again, that's precisely the time we need hope the most. If everything's going well, if you're healthy and the sun's shining and your belly is full and all's right with the world, you rarely stop long enough to wonder about what God has planned for the next chapter. But if it's cold and overcast like a chilly Sunday morning in Pittsburgh, or if you find yourself in a hospital waiting room, or if things begin to look quite serious, for whatever reason, it's in those moments we dig deep and we draw on the reserves of our faith. And in those moments, what we do is we look beyond the immediate situation and we glance toward the horizon that God has promised. A horizon that can only be captured through analogies of lions and lambs and wolves together, of trees and people living out their lives. And the image of giving birth is always wrapped up in those visions. The Apostle Paul, when he tried to explain this idea to the church in Rome, basically said the same thing that Christ did. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, Look, we know that all of creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only creation, but we too, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, for the redemption of our bodies. But it is in hope, in hope we are saved. Now, neither what Paul says or even what Jesus says takes away the reality of labor pains takes away the reality of loss or suffering, of injustice, of trying to live out in a hurting and broken world a life of integrity. But what it does do is it affirms that labor pains and suffering are not what define us or define our lives. Yes, the temple of Jerusalem will be destroyed, but what the church would come to understand is that they were no longer bound to the temple. They were called to a fellowship, a communion of justice and love outside the temple walls. And yes, there would be war and rumors of wars, but we are not captive to that vision we can take our fingers off the triggers and our hands off the launch buttons. We can pursue policies of detente and disarmament, and we are not to be defined by violence. And yes, there will be famines and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes. But those are not sent by God to punishment, no matter what you might have heard at two in the morning on cable TV. The disasters are often the result of either living on top of a turbulent yet fragile world or living amongst people and politicians unwilling to step away from the current path of ecological self-destruction. But we need not be defined by those disasters. And through it all, and sometimes despite it all, something else is waiting to be birthed. Something else has been glimpsed by us, has been seen by us even as in a mirror dimly. By God's grace, we have held it in our arms. We know it to be true. And in Christ Jesus, we trust and believe it is real. I have a favorite verse in Zechariah chapter 9, where the old prophet says, we are prisoners of hope. And from such yokes of salvation and grace that have been given to us in Christ, may we never be released. Now Jesus sat on that hillside with his disciples, looking across at the city of Jerusalem. And the two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew and James and John, 
They wanted to decode the clues about when the coming kingdom would be established on earth. And Jesus deflects their question and warns them, don't overread the prophecies. Don't be led astray by people who claim to be experts on the world to come, but don't have a clue about the world that is. Jesus doesn't deny that there will be times of hardship in this life, but he reminds us, even amongst it all, consider the lilies of the field, the sparrows of which not even one falls without our Heavenly Father knowing, and the children of such is the kingdom of God. Rather than wringing our hands and try to see everything around us as signs of impending doom, Jesus to the disciples and to us, tells us to breathe, to trust, to recognize the interplay of both minor and major intervals in the song of life, and know that while birth pangs may be inevitable, they lead to new life. Lydia Kiesling ended her little essay on pregnancy with two more powerful images. She said, I've always been afraid of flying, but when I flew while pregnant, I would feel the fetus knocking in a friendly way from inside me, patting me like I was a frightened horse and it was the groom. It felt like I had the nicest, smallest, most delightful travel companion imaginable. And I also admit that sometimes while pregnant, I felt like I was an old whaling ship creaking and grinding and pulling through the waves. But I also felt sometimes like the whale because whales are full of milk and oil and they sing to their sweet calves in the dark water. So all in all, it felt like a miracle. In the coming days, Many of us will gather together as friends and family to tell stories, stories that are well-rehearsed and often well-remembered. And many of us will share about our own struggles and our joys, about being bone-weary of this COVID season, about daring to glimpse a way forward out of this pandemic. And we will offer songs that sometimes are in minor keys, about times when birth did not come, about times when success eluded. But we will also offer words in the major mode about being a people of faith who have moved forward, who have trusted in Christ, who walked this lonesome valley, who died and yet who rose again, and who will come again. And so remember to sing the song of our faith. In Christ, there is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and more is still to come. This is just the beginning of what it is to be. Birth pangs felt by us, prisoners of hope. Amen.